So this morning we're going to be concluding our series called Be Present. Be Present. And uh, we've been talking about this the last several weeks. We have a very present God. So Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. This morning, the word of the Lord that you heard in tongues and interpretation, the Lord said, draw from the power of my presence. When he's present, there's power right? When Jesus was walking and there are people that are pressing in from all around and, and they, I don't think that they fully grasp or understood who he was and, and what they were actually trying to press into. But there was one woman who when she reached out and she grabbed a hold of the hem of his garment, he said, I felt virtue or I felt power flow out of me into her. And she had, she had been sick for 12 years and instantly she was healed because she reached Realized she was present in that moment with the Lord. She realized God's present right here, right now. And if I'll just reach out in this kind of atmosphere, then power can flow from his presence. Amen? Amen. If you'll just reach out this morning, power can flow from his presence right into your life and right where you need. What we talked about a few weeks ago is that he is, I am. He is, I am. I am. And we talked about the fact that God always existed. He created everything. And although he he stretched out the universe with the span of his hand, he's your I am. When you're in need, he's the one that's right there present with you. And so I've been encouraging you, when you get into difficult situations, you just need to pause and you need to say to yourself, he is my I am. He's not just the great I am. He's not just the the one that always existed and always will exist. He's not just the one that created the universe, but he's present with me. Wow. He is my I am. Last week, we talked about us being present. We talked about the present church. We talked about how we as the church, you know, there are so many so many times today that the church is focused on the past, but we need to be the present church, and we need to be present in what we're doing in, in fellowship and in generosity and in serving evangelism and in having the supernatural occur in our midst continually. Right, is there anybody that believes that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that when we call on his name, he hears and answers, and he's still the God of miracles, and he's still the God that today wants to show up, and sometimes it just happens right in the middle of a service that you just reach out in your faith, and you just stretch out and say, Lord, I believe, and God will just heal you right there. Sometimes it happens at the altar call. Sometimes it happens when you're just at home, and you're, you're seeking the Lord and praying. Sometimes it might be when you're at work, and someone says, boy, I just don't feel good today, and you just ask. And I've asked you to do this this week, to to ask God to give you divine appointment and then to pray bold prayers, believing God to do what he said he would do. Have you been asking God to give you divine appointment? And then if, if someone comes and they say they're struggling or they're sick or they're hurting or they got a problem, then you need to just bold, maybe they, maybe say, oh, they wouldn't understand, pastor. But it's not your responsibility to make them understand. It's your responsibility to say, let me pray. Could I pray for you? Could I just pray right now? And not just to say, I'll pray for you and put it off till later when they're not there, but to pray with them. There's a difference when you pray with somebody and you pray for somebody. And ask God, Lord, give me divine appointments. Now, if you weren't here last week and you didn't pray that specific prayer, I invite you to join us this week and say, Lord, give me some divine appointments. And help me to not miss them. I had some divine appointments this week. I had one divine appointment this week. I had a, a, a couple boys who um, I'd never even met before, but their mom, many years ago, she, she uh, knew the church and she had come here and, and uh, she had called and, and asked if her boys could be baptized. And so I had the privilege of having these young men come over to our house and uh, they got baptized. I got to baptize them in our pool. Uh, this week. And so uh, what an incredible opportunity uh, just to, to do baptism right there uh, at, at my house and, and to be able to bless these young guys. And just to think, man, out of the blue, people are calling and saying, we need, and uh, her one son is going to be going into the service this week. And so wanted to, before he left town, wanted to make sure they've given their lives to the Lord, make sure that they were baptized. And what an opportunity. I said, man, that's great. I've never had an emergency baptism before. That's awesome. 
Today I want to talk to you about this subject for a few minutes. Be present where you are. Be present where you are. Now, somebody might say, you can't be where you're not. Think about that statement for a minute. People say, well, you can't be where you're not. And that might seem true on the surface. But if you think about it for a little while, you'll realize that that can be the case. And sometimes physically you're somewhere, but you know, emotionally you're somewhere else, or mentally you're somewhere else. And sometimes we're not all there. Now, don't, you don't have to nudge the person next to you when I say that, okay? Sometimes we're not all there. We're not all right where we are physically. We're, we're, we're not engaged. And I, I want to give you three quick points about this. First of all, being present in the present that he's given. He's given us this present right now. And sometimes we can physically be where he's placed us, but emotionally we're not there, or mentally we're not there, or spiritually we're not there. Now, I want you to think back maybe in your life to times maybe this week or maybe even already this morning where that hasn't been the case. You, you haven't been present where you should have been present. You know, sometimes you might be at work and you know you're at work and you're in a meeting or you're doing, you're on the job or you're doing whatever and you're daydreaming. Now, none of you have ever done that. I'm not asking you to raise your hands. Okay, I don't want your boss to, you know, wonder. But you know that maybe it was somebody else that you saw at work that they were there and they were in the meeting or they were doing their job or they, you know, but they really weren't there. They were daydreaming, and in their mind, they're not at the job. In their mind, you know, they're playing golf, or in their mind, they're on vacation, or in their mind, I don't know, maybe they're napping. Who knows what they're doing? And all of us have experienced that. All of us know what that's about. But it can actually be dangerous when it happens on a wider scale. You know, when you were married, you, you looked at your spouse and you thought, this is the, the, the woman of my dreams or this is the man of my dreams. And, and you're just so head over heels in love. And maybe, you know, they just kind of embodied, you know, everything that you, you know, had dreamt about. But now you can't even remember what that feeling is like. And maybe if you're not careful, you can allow your mind to go places that it shouldn't go and to not be fully present. Amen? And we need to make sure we're fully present there. Some of you, when you got hired at your job, you told everybody, this is such a blessing of God. It's the favor of God. You were so excited. You were giving testimony and talking about how, praise God, the Lord gave me this wonderful job. I love it. And now you just get up in the morning and it's drudgery. You have to go to work and you talk about your job with disdain because you hate your job. Why do I have to do this job? And, and you look at it as a curse rather than as a blessing. And if you're not careful, in your mind, you're there, but you're really not not there. Sometimes the present that God gives us is not just all wonderful and roses and, and happy, right? And we have to determine that I'm going to be present. And we need to be present so that we can absorb the, the, the impact of moments in our lives. We need to be thankful for whatever Whatever area that we have in our lives. Sometimes people say, I don't have anything to be thankful for, Pastor. Now, if you've got kind of that kind of an attitude, boy, I'm upset and I'm mad. I don't have anything to be thankful for. Let me just tell you, it's all perspective. You live in the greatest nation in the world. And the worst off among us is, is really in better shape than probably about 80 or 90% of the population of the planet. You're blessed. You're blessed. I'm telling you, you're blessed. You know Jesus as your Savior? Then it doesn't matter even all the things that happen in this life and however hard or however bad or however difficult it gets. You have eternity with him. Wow. You're blessed. You're blessed. If you're able to get up and be here this morning and not be in a hospital bed or not you know, be struggling like some other people are struggling, then you're blessed. Is that good? We need to be thankful for the moments that we have. Because you know this life, it's a vapor. It goes that quickly. And it's a gift from the Lord. 
And sometimes we waste the gift by not being present and absorbing. Lord, thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. I'm going to choose to rejoice. I'm going to choose to be glad in it. I'm not going to sit and complain about everything that's wrong. It doesn't take anybody, any gift or talent to be able to find something that's wrong. Everybody can find something that's wrong. we got to work and say, Lord, I'm going to find everything that I can give you praise for. I'm going to give you praise for. Thank you for this day. Thank you for these moments. Thank you for the season of my life. As I was, as I was kind of you know, pondering that, the Lord spoke to me. There was a season in my life. I remember back in, in, in um, 1991, I was working uh, at Church of God Youth Camp the summer of 1991, and I was on the uh, the tennis courts I'm walking by at night and it's black. And back then our camp was uh, really big and we used to have kids the, the, um, all the way on one end was uh, where we had church and all the way on the other end was where we had kind of snacks and fun time after church. And it was a putt-putt golf course up there. And um, so we had staff that would be stationed all around because all the Students had to walk all the way from one side to the other side. It was really dark. And I don't know if you've probably never been around students that maybe would take advantage of the opportunity to sneak off in the dark. And so we have people kind of stationed all the way through. And I'm walking by the, the, the tennis courts and I actually saw a guy and didn't see him until I was right there on him. He was just sitting there, just totally quiet. But he was one of the staff that, you know, they had asked that night, just stay here, make sure kids don't go that way, make sure they keep going this way. And uh, so I came up on him and I introduced myself to him and I said, what's your name? And he said, my name's Colin Roberts. And I said, oh, nice to meet you, Colin. Where are you at? And he said, well, I just, you know, I became the youth pastor of uh, the uh, Church of God in Levittsburg. And so I got to know him a little bit there. And I did not realize what happened that night, that this guy that I met who was just happened to be sitting here on the tennis courts at camp would become my best friend in the entire world, that him and I would start doing ministry together, that we would start, that, it, you know, our youth groups would start to grow together, that we would start, you know, doing youth camps together and, and that we would be, you know, doing video at youth camps and taking students on missions trips and we would go out of the country and take students, you know, on foreign missions trips together and, and he would just, the Lord used him to grow me and, and use me to help him and we've developed a lifelong friendship because of that. We've led youth camps together. We work together. And in 2008, I, I kind of didn't even realize, and there, a whole lot of things had happened, and, and, and Colin was, was moving away, and, um, and, and, and he was moving to Florida. And he came to youth camp to say goodbye to me because he was leaving then. And um, when he got there, I had just, they just had to take me out the night before because my back was hurting so badly I couldn't even walk. And I ended up from that having to go and, and ultimately have back surgery. And I didn't even get to say goodbye to him. It was just, you know, one of those horrible situations how the timing works out. And afterwards, I just, I just lamented. I'm telling Jessica, I can't believe he moved away. Now, I talked to him on the phone, and, you know, but it's just not the same as having your friend there with you that you can just hang out and just be together, right? Just not the same. And we still have connection. And last night we were texting each other last night and, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking. And we still have that, that friendship, as you know, when you have friends like that, you just pick up immediately wherever you're at. You can, just, you can talk to them about anything. But it never is the same as that season that we had. What an incredible opportunity that we had for all those years. And I told Jessica, I never appreciated fully the gift that God had given me there until it was over. Until that season right there wasn't the same anymore. And then I realized, wow, what an impact that was in my life. Can I encourage you? Don't wait until a season of your life is over to appreciate the impact of the present. Be all in. Be present right there where God has placed you. Today is a gift, and that, that's why it's called the present. You know, once you... Once you leave a season of your life, you can't go back. One day you wake up and your school years are all done. One day you wake up and you're not in your 20s anymore. And then the next day you wake up and you're not in your 30s anymore. And then the next day you wake up and they're sending you a golden Buckeye card, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
And then the next day you wake up and you're over at the social security office trying to file your paperwork. And the kids are grown and the house is quiet. And then you look back and you will look back and you will think, wow, I didn't fully appreciate the gift that God gave me in the seasons of my life. The time that I had with my kids and the opportunity that I had. And, and then we tend to grieve over, over lost time and over, over moments that you really did not appreciate and you let them slip away and over opportunities that the Lord had but you missed and over words that you didn't share and over things that you didn't say. We need to be present in the present that he has given us. Is that a good word this morning? Now, let me just share with you, we need to be present with him in the present, even when the present's hard. Sometimes we go through hard days, and if somebody told you that when you give your life to Jesus, praise God, it's just going to be wonderful every day. You're going to get up, and the roses are just going to be blooming all the time in your life. They lied. Because in knowing Jesus, it does not mean that all your problems go away and everything's just roses all the time. You know, there are roses and there are also some thorns because in this world, Jesus said, you'll have some trouble. But then he said, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have hard days. And, you know, sometimes we pray and sometimes God doesn't immediately answer every prayer. Are you aware of that fact? Sometimes we pray for healing and God doesn't go, oh, you, okay, there immediately. Sometimes we pray and, 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 you know, we ask God, Lord, that we've got this suffering going on over here and God doesn't immediately remove the suffering and sometimes, you know, there's pain and God doesn't immediately take the pain away. God doesn't heal every circumstance instantly. Sometimes there are seasons and the Lord wants us to draw close to him continually. Whether we understand or whether we don't, whatever situation that we're in, we need to learn, you know what, God, you're in control of this. Here's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. Verse 11, he said, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I think he could even be content in Michigan. Those of you that are Ohio State fans, you may wonder about that, but I've learned whatever state I'm in therewith to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. We need to learn that we can be content because he's present whether or not we have all our needs met, whether or not everything happens the way we want, whether or not God answered the prayer in the timing that we thought he should have answered it, God's present. And if God's present, then I'm okay with that. I'm going to keep on praying. You know what? Worrying about something is always a waste. Worrying doesn't ever do anything. Worry always is a waste. But prayer is never wasted. People say, you know, I prayed about that and prayed about that and prayed about that, and God hasn't answered. You know what I say? Keep on praying. Keep on praying. You keep on asking. You keep on knocking. You keep on seeking. You keep on saying, God, I'm, I'm seeking you because prayer is never wasted. And I, but until the prayer is answered, I'm just going to say, God, you're in control, and you are present with me. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen. Somebody ought to be happy about that because he's present even on difficult days. He said in, in, in the 23rd Psalm, he said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with us. Because he's with me. I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I don't have to be afraid because I know he's present. And if he's present, I don't have to worry. If I've got Jesus with me, I don't have to be afraid because he is present. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, when, we, when, when Jessica and I lost our, our first child, that was hard. But he was with us. When, when we lost my mom, that was difficult. That was hard. But he was with us. When my brother passed away, it was hard. But he was with us. In every situation, he's with 
us. In the last three months, we have had 12 appointments with specialists in Cleveland for Brooke and for her eyes. And she's on multiple medications, and she's, you know, we're trying to work through this, and they're trying to figure it out and can't hardly figure it out. But you know what? He's with us. It's going to be all right because he is with us. I'm persuaded that I know that there's nothing that can separate me from the love of Christ Jesus. I know he's with me. I don't know everything. I don't know all the answers. I don't know what we're going to have to deal with. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. All I need to know is he is with me. And I'm going to be present in the present that he's given me right here. And I'm going to trust him with it all. You know, the disciples got all worried. They're out there, they're in a boat, they're in the Sea of Galilee, and the wind comes up, and the storm's coming, and and they're thinking, we're not going to get out of this. And Jesus is in the back of the boat, laying down, sleeping. And they go over to him, and they shake him, and they wake him up, and they say, Lord, don't you care about what's going on? We're dying. Don't you even care? We're all going to die. I mean, what a foolish statement. Really? How, how, really, just how totally stupid when you stand back and think of it. Now, I, it's great for me to be, I'm, I'm you know, here, I'm standing on solid ground. It's nice. I'm not in the middle of a storm. They're in the middle of the storm. I can understand. But really, their thought in the middle of the storm was, we are all going to drown in this lake with God. It doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? That God's had this whole plan that that he stretched out the universe with the span of his hand, that he he came down here to this planet, that he spoke and there was light, and that he that he created a man out of out of dust, and that he came down and he he was with him every day, and that for all these thousands of years he gave a promise to Abraham and he gave a promise to David, and and that there was gonna be a Messiah that was gonna come, and, and, and that then he sent his only son to come to Bethlehem to be born as a baby in a manger. And he lived here for 33 years. And then he he died in a boat. (laughs) See, the problem was when you're in the middle of the storm, you start to get your vision messed up because you're not realizing that all the wind and all the waves and all the storm and all the stuff that's swirling around you, that is not more real than the fact that Jesus is in the boat. You know what all of them could have said? Let's just go ahead and take a nap with him. We can all go to sleep because if he's in the boat, everything is going to be all right. He's with us. He's present. It's all going to work out. I don't know how he's going to come into your situation, but I'll tell you this. As long as you've got Jesus in your boat, you're going to be all right. You just need to make sure that he's present and that you are in the present that he's given you. Is that a good word? You know why? Because he is Emmanuel. Jesus is Emmanuel. The love story that God has with with, with, with us, with humanity. He's always desired to be with his people. All the way from Adam and Eve walking in the garden with them. Revealing himself to them. And then he, he revealed himself over and over and over. He, he revealed himself to Noah. He revealed himself to Enoch. He revealed himself to Abraham. He revealed himself to Moses. He revealed himself to Joshua. He revealed himself to David. He revealed himself to the prophets. And he would talk to them. But then he said, you know what? I'm going to go down there. And I want to be one of them. I don't want it to just be a temporary thing. But then Jesus came. And he was not born. You know, there could have been a trillion ways that we could think of that God could have came down. And, and, a, and a, a trillion more that we couldn't even fathom that he could have came down. But he chose to come as one of us. Wow. Do you know how much he loves us? To, to decide to be one of us. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. 
Jesus said, I came to be with you. You know, I hear people refer to God as the man upstairs. And I think they must not know him very well. Because when I think of my God, I don't think of him as the man upstairs. He walks with me. He talks with me. He lives inside of me. I don't think about him as some kind of a distant God that's off somewhere. No, he's with me wherever I go. There he is. He's present. He doesn't desire us to look at him as some sort of a distant, far off God. No, he's present with us. See, if he's Emmanuel, then I am never alone. Come on, think about it. If he's Emmanuel, he's not the man upstairs. He's God with us continually. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Jesus gave us that promise that he would be with us. Wow. Lastly, my challenge and your challenge continually is to be present with him. We know he's present with us. The question is, are we present with him? See, God's with us because he promised that he would be. But we often willingly leave his presence. We often willingly leave the presence of the Lord. Sometimes it's because we're distracted by other stuff, shiny things over here. We're like little kids sometimes, aren't we? We're like the dog in Up. We're just running along. We're doing it. Squirrel. <laughs> I'm focusing on being present with Jesus. And Lord, I'm thanking you because you're in charge. Whoa, wait a minute. What's this going on over here? I know you've never been there, right? But I get easily distracted with stuff in the world. And the enemy knows that. And so he constantly tries to distract us. And get our focus off of being present with Jesus so that we are focused only in what's happening in the natural and in the flesh. And it's not necessarily just sinful things. It's just other things that aren't spiritual. They're not supernatural. They're not acknowledging the fact that he's here. Sometimes I'm just so focused on what I'm doing. I got a problem and I'm fixing it over here. And I think he's standing next to me going, do you know I'm here? I can handle that one for you. Or you could just keep on working on that. And getting more frustrated and more frustrated and more frustrated. Or you could just surrender that to me and we'll, we'll get this one taken care of. It is a daily struggle to be present with him. And sometimes your pastor, me, I, you know, sometimes I am spiritually schizophrenic. Some of you are starting to wonder. On one hand... I'm over here, I'm praying, I'm seeking God, I'm feeling his presence. I'm, oh, I'm praying in faith. Oh, yes, Lord, thank you that you're in control. Oh, Lord, I thank you. And then something comes up, and I, well, what in the world am I going to do? And I immediately think of myself as the resource rather than him as the resource. Nobody else in the room ever has that trouble, do you? You know, one minute you're, you're, you're just full of faith and full of, oh, God's anointing and God's power and God's going to take care of it. And the next, we're just wringing our hands. How's this going to work out? And I think that Jesus is saying what he said all along. He's saying, come to me. Come to me. All you who are laboring, you are working, you're trying your hardest, you're doing your best, you're trying to work it all out on your own. Come to me, you who labor and you're heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Wow. Just come over to me because I'm with you. The question is, are you with me? I wanted to share something with you from Bill Isaacs. Most of you know our, our state bishop, Bill Isaacs, and his wife, Kathy, passed away several years ago. And, and after that, he had written, this was two years ago, this was August of 2012. And I just love his words. I want to read to you something, a part of what he wrote. 
He said, since the death of, of Kathy, I've realized and I've, I've really been working at developing a mindset of living in the present. Forcing my mind away from the hurtful and painful memories of the past and resisting the temptation to live ahead in the future, which is so uncertain and scary. It's a daily discipline, and sometimes I do well, and other days I fail terribly. Anybody else in the room identify with that one? However, God's forming something in me that will last, and in my spirit I keep hearing the encouragement of God to keep going. Joshua 1.9 has been so prevalent in my heart since the early spring. With these admonitions is the challenge to move forward with life and ministry and vision, knowing that God is with us. In case you're wondering, Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Are you hearing me? Don't be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. I walk over here, and he's with me. I walk over here, and he's with me. After church is done today, I'm going to go get in my car. We're going to drive to Pittsburgh because i got to catch a plane. And while we're driving down the road, he's with us. And he's already down in Pittsburgh. When I get down there, I know he's in Pittsburgh. That's an anointed place, black and gold all over. <laughs> we get on that plane, and when we're flying, and you know we're 20,000 feet in the air, he's with us. Who's that? I'm worried about flying. I'm not worried about flying. Flying's fun. I love flying. But even if I were worried about flying, you know what I would do? I would have to say to myself, he's with me. He's in charge. He's got it all in control. I just have to sometimes remind myself of that song that they taught us when we were in children's church. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. You know, that'll bring peace to you if you think about it. That's some, that's some good truth right there. He's got every situation that you're facing and that you will face right here in his hand. And we get all worried. We get all upset. And we worry about what happened and we worry about what's going to happen. Let me give you a statement and you may want to write this down. If you're depressed... If you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. If you're at peace, you're living in the present. I'm going to say it one more time. If you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. If you're at peace, you're living in the present. When I get alone with him and I just say, God, I know you're with me now. I, I want to just be with you. Then I'm reminded, God's got this. God's in control. He's bigger than all this. If I'll just quiet myself in the middle of all of the noise, he'll speak. If I, just, if I will just intentionally quiet myself to be with him, I know that he's with me. Here's what Psalm 46 verse 10 says, be still and know. It's in the stillness that the knowing comes. Be still. Stop all the worrying and all the anxiety and you know, all, of the, all, all the other stuff that's going on. Just be still and know that I am God. As they come to the instruments this morning, you can let the worry of the past and the anxiety of the future fade away. And say, Lord, I just today want to be still and know that you are God. I just want to be still and be present with you. He was never more present than he was 2,000 years ago on Calvary. When he came as a baby in a manger... To be Emmanuel, one of us. And then he lived as one of us. 
fully God and yet fully man at the same time. God in human form. And there was crucified. There he suffered the penalty for my sin and for your sin. There on Calvary, he demonstrated what he meant when he was Emmanuel, God with us, that he was not just there beside us, but that he was willing to take the suffering that we deserved. My sin and your sin, the penalty for that is death. And he said, I willingly will accept the penalty. I will pay the price. And if you're here today and you're far from him, God's closer than you think. He's not the man upstairs. He's present here. The question now is, will you draw near to him? He's given us this promise that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. When you call on his name, he'll answer. And if you're far from him today, he's calling you back again. With heads bowed and eyes closed, without anyone looking around this morning. Maybe you are far from him. Maybe you are struggling in sin. Maybe you know there's sin in your life. And even when I bring that up, the Holy Spirit starts to convict you. Because there are some things that you know aren't right in your life and God's calling you to get them right. He's present. He's here. And he wants to be the very present help in the time of trouble for you. If you're just distant from him, maybe you say, you know, Pastor, I've accepted him before, but I'm not living right. I I haven't been living with the Lord. I haven't been walking with him. I've been walking in sin, but I want to correct that this morning by repenting of sin, and I want to surrender my life over to the Lord. Now, if that's you this morning with no one looking around, heads bowed and eyes closed, and with Christians praying, would you just hold your hand up so that I can see this morning and say, yes, Pastor. I want to repent of my sin and accept Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. I see those hands. Is there anyone else? Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Is there anyone else this morning? Praise the Lord for there are five people this morning that raise their hand and say, you know, I want this morning to repent of sin and to surrender my life to the Lord. Now, as that's the case, I'm going to pray a prayer. And I want those of you that raised your hands, I want you to pray this to the Lord. And he will hear and he will answer. I'm going to ask everybody in the room to pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. But I'm coming to you to repent, to turn from my sin, and to draw close to you. I thank you for your love for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. Thank you that you are present right now with me. I surrender my life to you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Someone rejoice in this place this morning. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. God, we thank you indeed this morning that you hear and you answer when we call on your name. You are present, Lord. Hallelujah. We give you thanks for that. As the men come and prepare to serve us this morning, we are going to receive 
communion together. We're going to receive the Lord's Supper. Marty just handed me a note and said, because they repented, he will take away the mental torture. Maybe some of you have just been struggling in areas of your life. And this morning, the Lord's saying, I'm going to remove that that the enemy has tormented you with. Praise God. Hallelujah. Not only is he our savior, he's our deliverer. Amen. He's the one that sets us free. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we have the opportunity in accordance with the word of God to celebrate together the fact that Jesus gave his life for us. According to scripture and what Jesus told us, we need to do this until he comes. And we do this in remembrance of him, in remembrance of the fact that he gave his life for us. So I'm gonna ask you this morning if you would to stand. In just a moment, you'll come down, you'll receive the elements, and we'll have you return to your seat, bringing the elements with you. And once everyone has received them, then we will all partake together. Would you come? Oh 